Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming out today. My name is Elizabeth Wilder, and I am the current Tennessee Williams uh, playwright in residence here at Swanee. Um, I'm excited to be here today uh, to introduce to you the new Tennessee Williams playwright in residence, who will be here for the 2015-2016 school year. Um, we have these uh, wonderful actors who have um, come in and sh to share their time and talent with us today. Um, so before um, I pass it off to Sherry to introduce her piece, I want to tell you a little bit about her. Um, she's the 2015-16 Tennessee Williams Playwright in Residence. She was the 2013-14 Audrey Resident at New George's and uh, a 2014 Walter E. Dakin Fellow here at the Swanee Writers Conference this past summer. Um, and she's also a member of the um, Dorothy Streslin uh, Writers Group at Primary Stages. Um, her plays Lydia or the Girl at the Wheel uh, was a radio play about the earliest days of burlesque, um, which aired on uh, national public radio. And her short story, Yeah, We Got That, was featured on Playboy Radio. Um, her, she wrote the screenplay uh, Story of D about the real story behind the writing of the famous sadomasochistic novel Story of O for Nicole Kidman. Um, she's currently the area head of undergraduate curriculum at New York University's Dramatic Writing Program. Um, so without further ado, um, I welcome Sherry Nadia. Thank you. Hi. How are you guys doing? Is everyone feeling like a mature audience member? <laughs> okay, great. Um, I wanted to thank Elizabeth for that lovely introduction and um, Wyatt and Adam and Megan for being so generous by having me here. I'm so excited to get to know all you guys. Um, I went to University of Michigan and I teach at NYU, so it's always been enormous university and it's going to be interesting to be at a small, um, tight uh, college and I'm like just very excited to be here. So, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about me as a writer and about some of the work. Um, oh, and I wanted to <laughs> like thank actors. Actors! <laughs> thank you. They came from New York. This is Sarah Baskin, Ron Riley, T. Ryder Smith, and Chase Brantley, who's a student here, who's going to be helping us out. Um, you are nothing as a dramatic writer without your actors, so we love them a great deal. Um, so, when you listen to my resume, about sadomasochism and uh, all those other things. I sit here and I go, how did I end up being that person, right? Um, so Elizabeth mentioned my, one of my first, my first professional gig was this radio play I wrote for NPR about burlesque and uh, the dancers that brought it from England, the creators that brought it from England in 1868. Um, and a strange thing <laughs> happened after I wrote and it aired that suddenly I started being offered all these erotica writing gigs. And I was like, okay. And they weren't like, write a short story and we'll publish it. They were weird. So I was approached, I mean, they were. Like, seriously, we could sit here all day about the weirdness of these jobs that I got. You'll have to take my class to hear more about this. But um, I wrote a series of corporate videos for a um, very reputable consulting firm. And they came back to me six months later and said, how would you like to write a blog from the perspective of a New York City escort? And I was like, what client is this? Um, but anyway, I ended up doing that. And I had an alter ego. I had to keep my personal identity identity a secret. I had 20,000 readers a month, both men and women, which I thought was really interesting. And then from that, one of my stories ended up on Playboy Radio, and we were off to the races. And um, the culminating moment of this was I literally, so how many of you guys have been to New York? Okay, have you been in the taxis and they have the TV in the back there? All right, so I did this piece, I was in this piece on NBC News, um, which was about a boudoir photographer, and I somehow got roped into being in a rabbit fur bikini, and it ended up on taxi TV and ran for like eight months. I, I mean, like, it would not go away. And people would come up to me and they'd be like, are you? And I'm like, yes, that's me. So anyway, um, my husband and I, husband, raise your hand. Mm. Uh -huh. um, my husband and I would joke, 
what the heck am I putting out there that I keep getting these things? Oh, and all at the same time, I was getting all these children's plays commissioned. So we were like, uh, what is that about? <laughs> but anyway, so like we kept joking, what am I putting out there? What am I putting out there? And all of a sudden, I'm like, wait a second, what am I putting out there? And I thought about it, and I was like, you know what? I don't think this is an accident, as funny as it is. Um, I think it's that I'm fascinated by desire. I think desire is this unknowable, mysterious, um, changeable, unpredictable thing that's like a mystery. Um, it's a mystery for everybody. It comes and it goes, it ebbs, it flows. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It can't be directed. Um, I loved that, and I always felt like it's the keystone to trying to understand who somebody is, what makes them tick, what turns them on. Um, along with that, I was also really interested in the fact that intimacy and desire did not always go together. I mean, we know this, right? But that a lot of times they work in opposition. Um, the ways in which people block intimacy um, and what it takes to get real intimacy, um, I think is endlessly fascinating. So once I embraced this, and I would say to you, all of you writers, that a lot of time the things that you're like, what is that thing, or you're ashamed of, or you're embarrassed of, like, just let that thing go. Because sometimes that's who you are as a writer, and that's where you need to go. And I think you can write about anything as long as you're truthful. So in embracing this thing that I had, um, there were two things that happened. The first thing was that I became very interested in the canon of erotic literature, which people don't really talk about, but there's so many great works of erotic literature, and even ones that aren't exclusively erotic but have erotic um, aspects of them, like the Canterbury Tales and the Decameron. Um, and I read those two things, and I became very interested in stories within stories within stories. Um, at the same time, I was writing erotica over here and writing plays over here, and I wondered what happens if you put those two things together. Because on the page, um, erotica lives in a very different way than it does when you have bodies in space. Um, if you have a line that you have to walk, because if you push too hard, you get live nude sex on stage, which A, we're not doing today, sorry, um, and B, is actually not that interesting. It really isn't. I mean, not that I've seen it per se, but like a lot of times when you watch simulated sex on a New York stage, you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's just not. So what is that point where we're still in it and we're not thrown out and we're wondering, you know, stuff that isn't uh, in the text? So uh, this we're going to hear first, an excerpt of my play, The Tavern Wench which was um, my first attempt to put these two things together. It's also about the seduction of storytelling itself. Um, you're gonna hear this stage direction, but I'm gonna say it again, that um, it gets really intimate, right? Very sexual. The actors are clothed the entire time and they do not touch each other until a moment at the end of the play that we're not gonna see now. So, the tavern lunch. <clears throat> Setting a bar, time the present. Lights up on Arthur, late 30s, fit, tanned, weathered, a sailor. He sits at the bar. He has four old-fashioned glasses of single malt scotch lined up in front of him. The first one is only partially full. He grips the glass, concentrates. So we begin. Abel. Anthony. Adolf. Oh, Anton. Aaron. Arliss. Adam. Augustine. Adonis. Oh, come on. Come on, come on, come on, goddammit. Uh, Arthur. He was just Arthur. Wasn't he? He just couldn't help but just be. He was... He was sorry. He was so, so frickin' sorry. Uh, right, what this must look like. Right? Oh, I know, I know, I know. Believe me. A guy with a drink talking to himself at a bar, but it, it's not, it's not. It was, I was just, I was, I was just uh, trying to, uh, I, was tell, I was telling a story. Uh, it was a really, really good story. You know, you know they, they say the arc is the hardest part. Uh, it's, you've got to make it come back to you in ways unexpected. 
It's, it, it has to come back. He drinks. He will continue to nurse this first drink. I was in a bar just like this one uh, once. I had tin ceilings. It's uh, sawdust on the floor. There was a crack in the mirror that went all the way along the whole right side. I, just, I remember that. I remember wondering if someone had done it on purpose. I was on my way back from uh, Nevis. Uh, oh, I'm a sailor. Uh, did I say that? And uh, I'm from Mackinac, Mackinac Island, uh, where you get born and you get a boat just like that. <laughs> I'd been everywhere at that point, everywhere solo. Australia, the Channel Islands, Cape Town, Rhodes, Tortola. The things I saw, I tell you, it's like sheiks who made me part of their entourage, and Norwegian girls on party boats, Greek fishermen cowering at the moon, singing for their gods or their demons until someone threw an ouzo bottle to get them to shut the hell up. And, oh, and I, 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 taking in the aurora borealis uh, in all her glory, naked on the deck of my boat somewhere in the freezing Arctic Ocean. I, I, tr I tried to write it all down. And I didn't just even write just the good parts that happened. I, I wrote down the ones that I didn't want to remember, the, the pounding that my boat took on Tamales Bay. And my God, I mean, you've never heard anything until you hear the sound of the hull cracking beneath you. I, and at the time, I saw pirates, actual pirates, not, not a half mile away. And this squall, we had just hit. You ever feel um, like when you're not in your body? Like that everything has just happened to you before and will happen to you again and that it's happening right now for fuck's sake and that it isn't real. It just, I mean, that I mean, I, I mean, you think about it. The stuff you've actually lived through, it doesn't cause anything. It doesn't change anything. Does it? I mean, really? It, for all the fun and all the thrills and all the kicks. And so there I was in the bar with the crack in the mirror and I was thinking about all this. And I was actually goddamn pissed at the crack. And, and the fact that nobody fixed it, and, and, and what did they think it was just cute to just leave it there all exposed and wrecked like a funhouse mirror? And then, and then there she was. She just suddenly blowing in from the front door, all tattooed and arms and fingers. She was calling, she was yelling for a wrench. Her skin was the, was the color of coffee, her eyes smoldering, her hair, the sh shine. Just her face had it too. It was almost blinding. It was like looking at a. A, a, a vision, and this this thing it hung around there. I can fix things, I said. I, we ran up to her apartment. We were taking the stairs two at a time. Three. There was a rip in her jeans, right uh, right between her thigh and her ass. And that thing all around her. She just opened the door, and then there was water. There was geyser everywhere. I ran to the sink. I shoved my hand under the drain. I said, "Pliers! Give me some goddamn pliers before this drowns us both." So she handed them over. Our skin, electric, the shock, and then her wet jeans, her leather boots, her hair, the back of my neck wet, my jeans wet, her hand on my pants, under them, her nipple in my hand, my mouth over hers, over it, her panties on the floor, her sex in my hand, on, on my thigh, her waist, her thighs, the water under me, under my ass, under my arms. She, her hands on my chest, hands on my side, on my hips, on my back. Her and her and me and her and her and her and her and me. And Arthur comes. Shalamara oh. appears. I am sorry to ask you this, but did I actually fix your drink? Oh. Yeah, that's what I thought. It, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it looks as if you did. Stellar. <laughs> the details were kind of, uh, wow. Wow. <laughs> that was, that was. Um, yes. Yeah. It was. <laughs> <laughs> are you all right? Who are you? Uh, <laughs> you who fixed my drain. Oh, oh, well, you make that sound so tawdry. Uh, oh, I'm Arthur. Arthur Copen. I'd uh, shake your hand, but I'd really rather touch you somewhere else. Would you? 
Yeah, I would. I really. He moves toward her. She scoots away. A seductive chase. Oh, a tease. Probably not the proper use of that word, now, is it? Well, you didn't exactly let me finish you, now, did you? She moves from him again. What? What? What do you call tease? I asked you to tell me who you are. I just told you. You told me your name. Oh. It's not the same at all, is it? Oh. Tell me yours first. Come on, it's only fair. We are naked. <laughs> Why, I'm Shalamara, of course. Well, that, that, that's quite a name. Yes, there's four A's in it. <laughs> Sounds about right. I've got one in mind. It's Pakistani, my name, after the gardens in Lahore. There's a terrace there, Farak Bakesh, meaning bestower of pleasure. Yeah, I'll bet there is. He comes after her again, she dodges him. Your turn. You, you drive a hard bargain, lady, and by hard, I mean... Uh, <laughs> Oh, you're not a fan of puns? Not a fan of double entendres. Oh. All right. She named me Arthur. My mom did. So I asked her why, because we don't have any Arthurs in our family. It's just me, just the one. She surprised me. She said it was for King Arthur, that Arthur, the, the guy with the round table, Excalibur, and the Holy Grail. Why, I said, well, I wanted to give you a quest. A quest for what? I don't know, she said. I thought you could find out. Ten years old, and she gives me that kind of cliffhanger. <laughs> well, it's a partial explanation, anyhow. So what is it, then? Well, uh, what are you... Your quest. Are you making fun of me? People like that story. It's, it's a story? No, I mean, you want to know about my name? I... All right, so with a name like Shalamara, smartass. It's not Shalamara, smartass. Well, let's see. What would you do? Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Don't tell me. I think Shalamara, you, you, you must. You, you name lipstick, don't you? Don't uh, be dumb. Uh, you design shelving units. You jump out of planes. You, you own your own yak. You, uh, Veronica. You, you what? I write erotica. A story, a night. Oh. All right. I write. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm a sailor, too. But so, so you just write erotica. You don't write anything else? No, no novels? No. It's important. No, no I know. And I, it's <coughs> honest, and I'm the very best there is. People want to get off, I get them off. Well, that, 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 that sounds honest. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? <laughs> What is it? Uh, Why are you laughing? Wait, so you write porn? No. I just <laughs> fucked a girl who writes porn. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, that was, all right. <clears throat> Come on, no, don't put your clothes back on, please. No, no just, all right, is that, is that where you're from then? You're, you're Lahore, you know? Uh, I was actually there once, the Festival of Lamps, I think it was called, years ago, eight, eight maybe ten. I, I can say, how are you, and where can a fellow get a beer in Urdu? That was a joke. It's a Muslim country. Time for you to go. Um, I said I was... Your shoes, your shirt, your pants. All right, okay. How about, uh, <coughs> tell me a story first. Tell you one? Like a bedtime story? Why not? We're already in our bedtime clothes. I don't do that. Well, maybe you should. Off you go. Arthur? Yes? But how can I go when I don't have a quest? No, I mean... You can uh, read one if you must. Pick a book on your way out. Wait, wait. You, you want me to take one of your books? Why not? Um, so, then do you want it back? I have multiples. I'm that kind of girl. <laughs> huh. So, you know, there was, a, there was a kicker to it, you know, the story. She named the dog Merlin. <laughs> like he was going to be any kind of help. <laughs> well, anyway. So. Well, I made you laugh. You made that part up. Who can say? Well, you should finish it in any case. It's the arc that's the hard part. You've got to make it come back to you in ways unexpected. That's what makes a good tale. All right. All right. 
All right, what? I'll tell you a story. You will? Well, that's great. Sit. That's, oh, sit. What am I, a pet? Sit. He stands, not sure she means it. He sits. My stories, by the by, they're dangerous little things. A man could get lost in them. So we begin. B. Bianca. Beatrice, yes. Beatrice. She was a queenly girl. Sound effect that she has entered the story. Shalamara becomes Beatrice, a haughty Elizabethan lady. Fair, powdered, pleasing to the eye, and lady to a kingdom that spread as far as she could see. She spent the day admiring the way her attire did flatter her person. Her waist was perfectly suited for wrapping one's hands around. Her feet, too, were perfect, tiny feet that could fit in a man's cool palm. It was the dream of tailors across the kingdom to design vestments for her. Of course, they had other designs as well, and she received them all, each and every one of them, allowed them to gaze upon her comely figure. But none would be allowed to measure her. None could lay a hand on her at all. One day there came to the castle a new tailor. He was called Cuthbert. Beatrice makes a gesture above Arthur's head to signal his entry into the story. Sound effect as he does and becomes Cuthbert. He was fine to look at. Full of charm, full of himself. So you are here then. What do you have for me? A corset, milady, if you please. Ooh, one that nips me about my tiny waist. Why, yes, yes. One that raises my bosom to the heights of a man's eyes. Yes. I have one of those already. Oh. A silk garment then, spun so thin that it would be... Oh, look, would you, how something does protrude from you. How it pushes against your fabric like something that wants to get out but can't. A uh, bodice of feathers. I do not think so. Stocking of ermine. I do like the fabric of your trousers. You, you do? How does it feel against your skin? Does it feel... Hot, soft. You can. Uh, what? You can touch. Oh, look! Is that a loose thread in my skirt? You'll have to excuse me. I need to change in my own quarters. Give me your shoe. What? I the right one. You dare ask for my shoe? No. I did not think so. You may take your leave now. I do not ask for your shoe. So you've said. I demand it. What? There is nothing to you in my regal presence. Do you understand? That is a bedtime story you tell yourself. No, I won't. What would you even do with it? Here, take it then. See if I care at all. Good day. Cuthbert goes to leave. You will take it as you depart my chambers. You will answer or you will be disposed of. Stop, I say. Stop. <laughs> I cannot walk about with one shoe. As you know, I will deem to give you the other as well. I do not want it. How dare you speak with such... I'll have your stocking. Your... Uh, I will... No! Place your fingers under your skirt to the top of your garter. You give directions now? She takes it off as slowly as possible. Do you hear the sound of it unfastening? Do you sense it under my skirt, sliding, sliding? Here is my stocking, then, you. <sighs> my, you smell it, do you? I want your overskirt. My. W wouldn't you like to see me while I watch you loosen it, while it slides down your comely frame? Wouldn't you like to watch my eyes, my lip, while you do that? You, you sound like you, you may have my overskirt. Huh? Will you... Oh, what does it smell of? Oh, I must have your underskirt. I give it to you. Your tunic. Yes. Your other tunic. Yes. Your shimmies. So, so I am unclothed. So you've seen me the way no man has. Um, I don't quite know how to say this. What? There, there is a key. <laughs> a key? Where, I ask, would there be a key? In you. In the folds of your most private self. Perhaps you were thinking it was safekeeping there. What? what? 
dearest God, what in the name of heaven? Well, the, the, the turning end does protrude out Don't of Don't look at me. Give me back my vestments. Why are you coming closer? I... I have to turn it. No, you don't. You can just leave it be. It's perfectly comfortable, I tell you. Why, I hardly notice it there. Yes, is. you mean for me to turn it. Don't, I tell you. The sound of a key turning, blackout, shall Amara, Arthur is alone. <sighs> and suddenly I was back at the bar. And I was sitting there with the same drink in my hand, the same people at all the stools. Downs the rest of the drink. <sighs> okay. That took an unexpected turn. Well, what the hell happened there? I was in her apartment. There was water on the floor. The pliers were right there where I left them. And then, and then I felt like, I, I don't know, I, it's like I was being sucked into her, I guess. Like, I felt like awesome and weird and freaking terrifying at the same time. And then, I, I swear, I saw things the way that she saw them. I, I, I saw the brocade of her overskirt, even though I never knew what the hell brocade or an overskirt was before. And I could, I could touch the velvet of her shoe. It was real, realer than that. But the key, the, the way it shined, and the most, it was the most real thing of all. And I felt like I had to put my hand around it. I had to feel it in my hand. But the sound, the sound of that click. You know what? I, I had things to do. Normal, non-trippy things to do. I had to do. I had to wash my boat for one. People don't get what it takes to maintain a boat. You know, it's very. But every every time I tried to do something, all these things that I did they, every day, the washing, the polishing, everything I had done for years, what they were, they just didn't mean. What the hell did I unlocked? He drinks. Shalamara appears. You came back. Are you an alcoholic? Wait, what? What kind of question is the kind to find out what other destructive and gruesome things you may have oh, hey, brought I... into my house and my home with your loathsome wait, wait, stupid? Wait, 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 stop it! Hi. Hello. I said hello. Yes. Hi. Uh. What? Did you do something to your hair? What? You look different. You. you... How? How do I look different? I... You're really beautiful. I wasn't beautiful before? No, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm not like this. You look less somehow, but more, too. Okay, I, do you have anything of substance to say at all? I go to work, just like I've done every day since I can remember, but my mind, it goes to you, and, and like there's no other choice in the matter. The way you looked at me, the, the noise you made when you, your breath caught, the way you bit your lip, the angle you held your head, how you... It's all so perfectly unfathomable. So, so, ugh, and I try to get it out of my head and write again. Believe you me, I try and it all starts all over again like a mirror shine to a mirror, shine to a mirror. So I ask you and you will tell me what in God's name have you done to me? I, uh... There was a key in your, um, you know. Okay, if you dare say something like hoo-ha. I've never said hoo-ha. Uh, you just did. No. Fine, I just, okay. Is it still there? No. I Good, I mean, I, that's good. I mean, I just, you know, I was concerned because if you had to go through a metal detector or something. <laughs> you didn't know it was there, did you? In the story. Of course I did. I'm the one who writes them. Of course. You don't write yeah, them. Of course. Sorry. Sorry. Well, you should be. You shouldn't go trampling into another person's head. Another person's... It felt... <laughs> odd. If you must know. Oh, yeah? Foreign. And shameful. It made me small. And yet, when you turned it, I, I felt like I might have came a bit. Oh. Like you had gorgeously, hopelessly wrenched me apart. She grabbed me across the bar. I thought we'd fall off the stools. We stumbled out of there. We were kissing, grabbing, stumbling up the stairs, stumbling through her door her mouth like a demon on my face, on my cheek, my ear, her biting my ear hard. I shoved her against the wall. I shoved my hand up her skirt and there was nothing, God, nothing. 
under there and all her whole body was sweating between her legs. She smelled, she smelled like the sea I had been to, like open water. I pushed her, one hand between her legs, the other knotted around her hair. She bit my belt, my stomach. She was a squall. And there we were on top of the sink basin, under the table, on top of the desk. Her legs splayed out, her feet stuck in the bottom of the drawers. I grabbed her arms, I pinned her to the bed. I took her like, like I was a rocket, like a meteor coming into, coming into. Arthur comes. I am sorry, but how on God's green earth do you know how to fuck like that? I write erotica, remember? Yeah, well, you must practice erotica. I do, all the time. I don't understand. You're quite ordinary, aren't you? What? Well, of course, you're fairly good in bed. I'll give you that, but otherwise... Oh, yes. Well, what am I besides ordinary in a fairly good lay? You're a sailor. You write. You have a quest. You have a dog. You're not very smart. Hey. And yet, it's like you know my... Uh, you know something I don't, don't you? <laughs> it's not funny yeah. at all. <laughs> The way you're laying there, all angry, your breath moving your breasts, I want to watch you tremble. She moves away. Why do you go away? No thanks, no trembling. Oh, but you liked it before in the story. Don't talk of that. No? No, 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 don't put your clothes back on. Don't, please, please, okay, please, okay, please. Can we just, can we just lie next to each other? I mean, wouldn't that be nice? I don't do nice. Well, neither do I, really. But wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be that would why it be, would be nice? I don't know. May I put my clothes back on? Yes. No. Just your shirt. <laughs> so I don't know. I just. Um, why don't you tell me about yourself? Really. This is what we're going to do when I have nothing on my bottom. But because you have nothing on your bottom, so. So I know where you're from. Farak Bakesh, bestower of pleasure. Yes, yes. Well, tell me about uh, the first boy you ever kissed. Oh. Come on. Oh, uh, whoever wants to hear those kinds of stories. I do. But it's always awkward. I like to think of you awkward before you were this. What's this? This. Rashid, a peasant boy. We... We snuck behind his tent when no one was looking, and when he kissed me, he made my lips a flower, and... Um, that sounds like a story. No, it doesn't. Yeah, he made my lips a flower? <laughs> See, I mean, you don't have to tell everything like it's a story. You can just tell it. So, tell me, uh, how, how you lost your first tooth? Oh, it wouldn't... Come on. It wouldn't come out. There we are. And? And... The whole town came to try to hand it like it was sport. The merchants tried to sell me potions. The potter thought he could encase it in clay, with a, then crack it with a pick when it hardened. The snake charmer, he thought if he played me, he could coax me out of everything. The tooth as well. Right. Uh, look, for the purpose of illustration, I'll tell you how I lost my tooth, okay? See, I was 20. You were 20 when you lost your first goddamn tooth? No, I didn't say my first tooth. I said, can I finish my story? Sure. I was in Sofia in Bulgaria, and it was Halloween, right? But I didn't have a costume, which wouldn't have been a problem exactly, except for the fact that there's some kind of major party every year in Sofia in this cave that you otherwise can't go into. I mean, a Halloween party in a, ga a cave in Bulgaria is so... I scoured the city for a costume shop, right? But when we finally found it, of course, there was almost nothing there because it was Halloween in Sofia. And uh, clearly there was only one costume shop in the whole damn country. So, but just before I left, I saw back buried in the back of the store, I saw that there was this Planet of the Apes head, you know, for a kid. It had been sitting there for God knows how long. So I bought it, I left the store, I go back to my boat, only when I tried to put on the ape head, it was too small, or my head was too big. But I shoved and I shoved, and I finally managed to get the thing on. So we go to a party, and after a few minutes, I started getting all lightheaded because I was, it was really, really hot in the ape head. And I go to take it off, but I couldn't. I mean, I really couldn't. 
So I started just thrashing around and trying to point, and people thought I was doing some sort of crazy ape dance, so they're all laughing and pointing, and they're imitating me. So finally, finally, I pulled so hard. You slammed yourself into the wall and knocked out your tooth. Yeah. And the tooth came out, but you still couldn't get the mask off. They had to cut you out of the hospital. Wait, I, had, I didn't tell you that part yet. No. You need to go. Wait. Take your things now. Wait, wait. Whatever's going on here, I don't know. Maybe we've met before. Maybe we just don't. Uh, no. But you feel what I feel, don't you? We're connected somehow. You feel it. You have to. Yes. You've got me feeling. Good. That's good. Is it? Um, when everybody first asked me here, they said, why don't you read The Tavern Wench? And I said, have you read the whole play? They said, yeah, we have. I'm like, you should read it again. So we're going to stop there. And if you want to find out the exciting thing that happens next, you'll have to take my class. Otherwise, you won't find out. OK, so um, <coughs> when you are a writer, everyone and their mother comes up to you and says, do I have a story for you? usually they do not have a story for you. It's usually like one line and it doesn't go anywhere. So um, there I was at my osteopaths and he said, do I have a story for you? And I'm like flat on the table, you know, like waiting for him to do something. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Just fix my back. And he goes, Himmler's massage therapist. Now, for those of you who don't know, Himmler was the second in command in Nazi Germany. He was the architect of the Holocaust. Himmler's massage therapist. So I'm like, is that a joke? Is this like a Mel Brooks, a Woody Allen kind of thing? And he's like, no, it's not. So it turns out there was this um, doctor of Chinese medicine named Felix Kirsten um, that was working with um, the, basically the rich um, and royalty in, um, in the Netherlands and in Sweden. And Himmler, um, unbeknownst to everyone, was beset with horrible stomach cramps that no conventional medicine, including morphine, nobody could treat him. So he hears about Dr. Kirsten, summons him to the Reichstag. Kirsten does one treatment for him, and he realizes this is the key to him not being in pain. So he makes him his private doctor. Kirsten has dedicated his life to um, to helping people, but now he's helping a person who's in turn killing thousands of people, what to do. Uh, he despairs and then he realizes, actually, he's probably uniquely suited to do something because um, he has Himmler in his most intimate moments. He is physically touching him. He has the power to manipulate him physically and he ends up manipulating him psychologically and he had hundreds and hundreds of people released from the camps. And ultimately, he ended up um, uh, negotiating, um, brokering a, an arrangement between the World Jewish Congress and um, um, the Nazi Germany to not bomb the concentration camps at the end of the war. So he saved uh, many, many people. But at the same time, he was a collaborator because he made Himmler better. So um, what does this story have to do with me, you might ask? It turns out, here's the interesting part, not that that's not interesting, that's super interesting, but um, Kirsten was a known womanizer with women all over Europe. And Himmler was obsessed with Kirsten's love life. And ultimately, this was the way he managed to also manipulate him uh, to the point where Kirsten got access to his private postal box saying that he wanted to send letters to his lovers that were in different countries. And Himmler ate this up, but really what he was doing is sending out information to these foreign governments who would then in turn send things back in perfumed envelopes to keep up this ruse. So very interesting story. Um, okay, so we're gonna be starting uh, on the fourth scene and what has happened uh, before this is um, we see Kirsten seducing Lorelei, 
who is uh, his newest mistress. So she's a virgin at the stop, the start of the play. We miss this, use your imagination. Um, uh, so that has happened. She found out that he's married and that he has mistresses all over the place. Um, Chase is going to be reading, there's a series of offstage voices. So though he's on stage, you'd really just hear um, an audio. And um, I think that's it. And I will read just a character description. Oh, I think I need to hold the mic. Thank you. Thank you. Are we okay? Anyone who's thank you. Are you gonna read from there? I'm gonna read from here. Stand up. Um, I'm gonna read from there. I'm just gonna be a civilian on this one. Okay, great. Um, just basically, what you want to uh, know here is that Lorelai, in reality, is blonde, and she's also 19, and she looks like a German milkmaid. So Sarah now looks like that. <laughs> Ron uh, is now Kirsten, and he is grossly overweight but very uh, charming. You're still charming. Um, and uh, um, he's a doctor of Chinese medicine with clients, uh, patients all over the place. That um, T is now Heinrich Himmler. And okay, so the set, just so you understand that, it's minimal, fluid, a desk, a bed, it's the shadows that are important. Everything once we enter the realm of Nazi Germany becomes elongated and exaggerated. Think the forced perspective of Leni Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will. Sound should be exaggerated as in film noir um, with the occasional tip to um, out and out horror. Mm -hmm. Okay. The offstage, uh, outside the Reichstag, the offstage voice of a Nazi guard. Who are you here to see? Uh, the, the Reichsfuhrer? No one is allowed to see the Reichsfuhrer. Oh, but I have an appointment, Felix Kirsten. I'm expected. Perhaps someone there has heard of me. I'm actually quite renowned. You know, my mistake. Uh, if you really don't want me, I'm happy to go back to my... You will follow me. The sound of a door lock, it echoes. Then another, 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 another. As if the room were being hermetically sealed. Dr. Kirsten, I presume... Oh. <laughs> Did I startle you? No. No, uh, there were lots of doors uh, and hallways, and I wasn't really sure that I was at the end. Uh, I do. You are Himmler? I am. Hi, Himmler. Ah, oh, uh, <laughs> yes, well. Uh, August Dern speaks very fondly of you. Oh, I am, yes, I am, I am very fond of uh, August Dern. Uh, Ludwig Kuhn, he speaks of you. Uh, Kuhn? Yes. <laughs> yes. He is your patient too? Uh, yes, yes, yes. He's a good man, um, one who's kind. He runs his business very you well. have it that the Fuhrer doesn't nationalize the potash industry. Oh, uh, I don't even know what potash is. The lions of industry want Germany to bend to their knees, you see. We should thank Providence that the Fuhrer came to Germany when he did to rescue her, to save us all from the tyranny of the Zionist industrialists. The guards treated you well. Uh, oh, uh, well, uh, which ones? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, forgive me, I only meant uh, that you... Doors, halls, guards. What can I say? They're very protective of me. You should see them around the Fuhrer, a glorious flock of swastikas framing the sun. Sit. Ah, thank you. Kirsten sits. Himmler doesn't sit. Kirsten stands. Please. Uh, you will not sit yourself? Himmler sits. I've often thought we've most lot, lost much in this city. No one walks. The peasant walks. The farmer walks. Their faces are ruddy. You can tell of their health. Uh, yes, yes. So uh, what do you treat Herr Kuhn for uh, then? I, uh, you must forgive me. I, I cannot tell you. Uh, the doctor, patient, privilege. Yes. Yes, yes, very good. A man who can be trusted with a secret. Not even a small hint. What ails a man? He seems to be quite robust, even the age such that he is. Kirsten oh. gets up. Oh, what are you doing? 
I, I will uh, walk with you. Oh, uh, no, it's not necessary. No, it's not a problem. Really? You should make no, I insist. Himmler walks. Kirsten walks behind him. Himmler turns. Kirsten turns. So, uh, Kirsten, you're not German. I'm Finnish. Ah, well, there's a Germanic quality to the Finns, I've always thought. You can see it in their pronounced height and... Aryan character. Well, forgive me, I should say that I am Finn, as that's where I have my citizenship, but I'm from Estonia, actually. Oh. <laughs> Estonia. But I, I do have 300 acres on a state uh, 60 miles from here. Well, so you've chosen Germany for your home, then? Well, uh, my main residence is in Holland, you see. Himmler takes off, almost at a sprint. Kirsten speeds out. It's only because the renowned Tibetan master I studied with lived there at the time, so... Himmler stops abruptly, possibly because of another twinge, which he again tries to hide. Kirsten keeps going, realizes, stops. <laughs> you are not in good shape. <laughs> I am very good at what I do. Uh, you like uh, Wagner? Actually, uh... Himmler turns on the radio. Wagner. Loud Wagner. Ever since I was a small child, I've been affected by debilitating stomach cramps, possibly stemming from two bouts of paratyphoids, two of pernicious dysentery, but also due to some trauma my mother experienced. You do not a, need to tell me. Oh, of course. It's my mistake. Uh, my medical records. He hands one slim folder slides over a box. I keep good records. Every doctor's visit, every condition dated, uh, noted, annotated. I won't need them either. But uh, no doctor in all of Germany has been able to cure me. Well, perhaps then you needed a Finn of Estonian descent who studied with a Tibetan master. <laughs> Sorry, it was a joke. Oh. <laughs> Let us uh, begin then. Take off your tunic, your shirt, and unbutton your trousers. Uh, my parents were herbalists. Oh? Yeah, yes, our, our ancestors. You see, they knew the cures because they were connected to the earth, but we in our towers, we've forgotten the goodness of plants. Hydric, open a group of fur, Hydric. Uh, I actually, I, I shy away from following. Plants. Yesterday, he tried to sell me on industrial honey. Right, sir, we superseded the bees, he says. Really, you must try it, but I won't stand for it. If I have honey, that is, which I often don't, I don't believe in excess. Oh, uh, oh, um, <clears throat> nothing, no, it's quite, it's, uh, this is quite a desk. Yeah, it's oak, the national tree of uh, Germany. Seeing that Kirsten glazes, Glaze is fixed on the desk. Heimler quickly disrobes. My grandfather cut the tree down himself. Mm. You see in the corner, those are his initials. He holds his shirt in front of him, covering himself. I, I, I didn't know if you needed a table. No, uh, you may lay yourself down on the couch, flat on your back. Oh, no, we could use the desk. I can clear it. I, I can take me a moment to put everything back in his rifle. Kirsten closes his eyes, leaves his body. He is all in ten eye. Heimler's throat, neck, chest, stomach. Sometimes Kirsten finds a spot and dwells on it. He's stopping there. Mm. Yes. Is there something wrong there? I've never been one for massage. I've always felt it was for the indulgent and weak. Oh! Stay like this. It always gets worse before it gets better. Oh! I hope you're right! Now, how do you feel? Uh, I, I, I f feel better. Good. Kirsten treats him again, dipping down again into the worst... Ah! Ah! I call it physio-neural therapy. You find the nerves that are affected and you penetrate them so deep... Ah! 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 The circulation opens up there is an oxygen again, nourishment, and the bad blood simply flows away. It's gone. Morphine would do nothing. And now it's gone. You don't understand. There have been radiographs and blood samples and blood tests and blood letting. 
have you done? I told you, it's only a question of the nerves. But I couldn't sit. I know. I couldn't stand without constantly... Yes. I hadn't eaten in three days. And? Aren't you hungry now? I must have you on hand at all times. <laughs> oh, that's not possible. No. Why not? Well, for one, I have other patients, you understand. Well, surely you could move them. They are as in need of me as you are. But I serve the Fuhrer. If you serve me, you're serving the Fuhrer. That may be so. And in serving the Fuhrer, you serve all of humanity. Well, uh, Herr Reichsfuhrer, I, I am uh, I'm humbled by your trust in me, but you're right now... You're not Jews, right? What? You know, that's illegal in Nazi Germany. Uh, you might have a spate of residual cramping, but that should clear up in about three... What, what, what if it comes back? Oh, it will. But surely that's not ethical. You, you have to... If you must know, I am not certain that I can treat you yet. What do you mean? You just did! Yes, of, of course, but I... What I meant is that this was a preliminary session to treat you, to really treat you. I would have to learn your body... I would have to learn where the problems really are, and it would take 14 days. A test. Yeah, you could call it that. Yes, I always got ones on all my schoolwork. That is the highest. Yes, I know. No, you're not a German. I thought I should explain. <laughs> so, this uh, test, when can we begin? As I mentioned when I first got here, I am going to the Netherlands to treat the royal family, and then to Switzerland. Have you ever failed? Your own test? Excuse me? What if there's someone even you can't treat, Herr Kirsten? What then? That's not possible. <laughs> as long as you're certain. That. If the condition manifests itself in the nerves, I can treat it. If, on the other hand, it's cancer... What? You don't have cancer. Good day. You know, as it happens, I am in Berlin for now, so perhaps... Tomorrow, then! How wonderful! I'm so glad you were able to clear your schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, you will not regret this. Scene change. Himmler disappears, replaced by Lorelei back at the Berlin flat. That's what he said? I should not be telling you this. Why not? I, I don't know. We I, don't have to tell each other everything you know. He hides his sickness. Well, he tries to, not very well. I could see it from the moment that I walked in. The pallid complexion, the cramps. There's like a third thing in the room. Every time I looked at him directly, it's as if there's someone else out there in the world who is playing him, this sort of a, a body double. or, or it's, you, you would see him. You would, uh, you would see him and you wouldn't think at all that he eats, with, what did you say, the ears of Jews in his morning cereal? Uh, I didn't really think that. Well, he kept trying to get me to stay, to be with him and only him, as if he were a, a small child. or A lover? Or, no. Well, if you ask me, he sounds like a lover. You think everyone sounds like my lover. Aren't they, though? Well, she pops chocolate into her mouth. Wait, is that chocolate? Oh, no. He takes it out of her mouth, smells it. Where would you have gotten chocolate? Herr Herlick had some. It's of an inferior variety. You know that, don't you? He throws it out. Here. Unwraps one in his pocket. Have the real thing instead. He comes to her. She steps away. Is it the nerves? What do you mean? I mean, is it you? Is it me for you? Or is it... If anyone else kissed me, if there was another man... Another man? No. If there are other women, why shouldn't there be another man? Oh. What? I am not prone to jealousy, Lorelei. It's simply not in my nature. I've seen how men can get. I won't be that way. Your freedom is too important to me. Mm, so when I kissed that nice Nazi Colonel Hartman just the other day, that was completely fine with you. Even when he, he stuck his tongue in my mouth? Well, that sounds enticing. There aren't other men. Yes, I know. You don't know everything about me, you know. No, I don't. How did he feel? Did he feel like 
like a Superman or a devil or? Oh, no, he felt like pain. All men's pain feels the same. There's this thickening under the tissue of your, under your fingers, and it's an impenetrable mass. You wouldn't feel it if you weren't looking for it, but if you, if you are, there it is. Where's mine? You want to know? No. He approaches her. He goes to reach towards her heart. She steps away. The vagus nerve. There's a parasympathetic connection to the heart. I don't like it when you use your treatment on me. It's like a trick. It's not a trick. It's physio-neural. Tricking me into showing you things. That's how you seduced me. I didn't. Will you do that to Himmler, too? No. What has gotten into you? Have you... Have you heard of Dachau? Scene change. Lorelei disappears, replaced by Himmler. Back in Himmler's office, Kirsten has just finished a treatment. Did I pass? You did respond to the treatment, yes. You'll stay then. It's decided. I can come to you whenever you need me with a few days' notice. But for now, <laughs> in looking at my calendar, I, I can wait until you're finished. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you were saying something about having a better offer. <laughs> It's not the case. I'm just, I'm, I'm merely very much in demand. <laughs> I'm sorry. Your lips look so funny when you say I'm merely very much in demand. <laughs> this is uh, an effect of the treatment. What is this giddiness? <laughs> Some people also cry. <laughs> <laughs> they think you're here on a political matter. <laughs> What? <laughs> but I'm the least bit political. But I've consulted you about the homosexual problem. <laughs> but, but, but that's untrue. Well, it doesn't have to be untrue. What are your opinions on the homosexual problem? <laughs> do you believe it to be related to an abnormal glandular development? <laughs> or do you believe, as the Fuhrer does, that it is simply a willingness to corrupt the moral underpinning of all civilization? <laughs> More importantly, do you favor castration? What is this about? <laughs> Above all else, Army and Germany must be fertile and multiply. The master race has been tainted by impurities that must be brought out just the way one does with the great racing states. Yet the homosexual refuses to breed. It is a betrayal to the Fuhrer and the country. It is why the older generation did well to drown them in the box. What I, what I, what I meant was it was only why would you tell people this is why i'm here if you are ill but i'm just saying if you don't want them to know do you? Uh, do you? i don't care there is really nothing wrong with it with being sick are you sick well, no but how do you know i'm around those who are sick all the time some of my best friends are sick people Oh, sorry. It's... My father is sick, if you must. Oh. I'm sorry. But, you know, no matter. He's elderly, technically. What does he have, if I may ask? Cancer of the esophagus. Too much rich food and drink. We, we thought he was indestructible. He asked me if it was dangerous to have sexual relations when he was 88. I think he meant it. He had this girl. And I don't know why I'm telling you this. If you stay, I can make you a colonel in the SS. What? He comes with a generous salary. I know you're not for want of money, but... No, this is not possible. Why? Because I'm honored, of course. General, oh. you drive a hard bargain, say you'll do it. I have the fear of himself sign the order. I've already asked. You asked the... Does, does he think that I am a consultant on the homosexual matter? Or is Frame it. The order. Hang it among your medical degrees. Oh, there's a thought. I, I am a Finnish citizen, as you know, uh, so well, I do well, not... It would only be honorary. You wouldn't have to march or anything. Oh, good to know. Unless you wanted to use the opportunity to get in shape. <laughs> that was a reference to a war. Yeah, I know. Because you should march with us. You cannot imagine. What it does for the soul. Only yesterday I went to the gymnasium with some of my senior SS officers to be one of a group of tall, blonde supermen. Moving together, breathing together, serving our Fuhrer together. 
You're staring at me. No. I only want to keep you happy. You know. You're a Buddha. You must be happy, like a Buddha. <laughs> well, to keep me happy, Herr Reisfuhr, I, I need to go to Holland, among others. Ah, Holland! My family is there. As you the Fuhrer says, they should bring whatever fate they deserve upon their heads! My wife, Ermgard, you see, she is there. She is the sun, the moon, and the stars. My, her and I and our two sons, I want to spend as much time with them as I can. You understand? Sure. Just like I want to spend all my time with my wife. You can't keep resisting us, you know. Sooner or later, you'll have to give in. Light change. Kirsten talks to an off-stage Finnish diplomat at the Finnish embassy in Berlin. So a man walks into a German bar and says, Bartender, I've been treating Hitler. Himmler, make it a double. No, no, that's not funny. You don't uh, have a problem with Nazi spies, do you? No, of course not. So Hitler visits a lunatic asylum where the patients all dutifully make the Nazi salute, wave as, as everyone else. Hitler sees one man whose arm is not raised. Why don't you just greet me the way that everyone else does? He hisses at the man, and the man answers, my Fuhrer, I'm an orderly, I'm not crazy. <laughs> no. Are you treating Himmler? Uh, no. You just said? I, well, I'm not treating him per se. I've only had a few sessions with him in between treating humanitarians and statesmen aligned with Finland and her allies. Voice whispers to other voices in Finnish. Oh, I really, really wish that we could just keep this between ourselves instead of everyone else in the embassy. And he is responsive to these treatments? Yeah, of course he is. Ambassador, please, as you know, when I chose Finland as my home, I fought for our country's independence. I was an officer in her army. As someone who has dedicated himself to such a high cause, I cannot also further the work of a regime who is so hostile against humanity and in general. he wishes for you to continue your treatments? He wants to honor me with a post as a general in the SS. Or be his advisor on the homosexual problem. I, maybe I can do both. Maybe I can be a general to the homosexual problem and march. Please, please, I'm surely there is a way that I can officially bow out. There must be something better that I can do for Finland. Stay where you are. What? He has confidence in you. This is good for Finland. Okay, let's think about this, shall we? You want me to make Himmler better? You understand? Politics. The pop of a champagne cork. A scene change back at Kirsten's Berlin flat. Lorelei holds the bottle. Congratulations, you're the doctor to Himmler. Her hands are shaking. She pours herself a glass, drinks. I cannot believe this is happening to me. You should have some. It's good. They say it's good, even if it's French. I'm not thirsty. Drink with me. Yeah. Do you like crepes? Why? Do you have crepes in that bag of tricks of yours? Yes. Which she takes with out some from her bag wrapped in a cloth. With strawberry preserve and whipped cream. Well, well the whipped cream is surely melted, but... He grabs the bundle and grabs a fork and a knife. He lunges into the pancake, almost inhaling it. Mm -hmm. He eats voraciously, like it's a feeding. I wonder... What are your thoughts... Yes? On polygamy? <laughs> Why are you laughing? It's not funny. Well, well it's illegal, for one. But it, what if it weren't? What then? What? Kirsten turns on the radio. The station is playing Wagner. He turns the station, Wagner. He turns it again, Wagner. But seriously? He turns the dial again, jazz. Ah, oh, jazz. That? is jazz but it's illegal it's illegal here i know she's never heard anything like it suddenly she dances a wild dance he laughs it's out of control he grabs her she grabs him they make love suddenly lorelei is on top they've never done it that way before lorelei comes in that way 
I like it that way. Maybe it means I'm growing up. Christian suddenly flips her on her back. Oh, I was enjoying that. The Finns, they want me to keep them informed, report back to them what he says. What? What who said? You know. The right. Shh. You, you said no. No, I had to say yes. How could you say yes? It's my country. I'm not a spy. I'm not. This isn't a thriller. We're not in a genre. She bites him on the neck. Ow! Hard. She gives him a hickey. What did you do? Where, where's your hand mirror? He goes to her bag, gets out a mirror, looks. Ah. I've branded you. You certainly have. Where's your compact? Don't cover it up. Please, please don't. Yes, Ermgard. Yes, she would love that. Lorelai knocks the glasses off the table. Crash. Kirsten picks up his things, goes to leave. Wait. What? They're going to declare war. Soon. Light change. Lorelai disappears. Kirsten is with Himmler post a treatment. War. 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 But why? Because the Fuhrer wants it. Europe has been poisoned by Jews, and the Jews in turn have further poisoned Europe. It's a vicious cycle. It must be stopped. Conquering is the only way we can strip each and every country of this pernicious influence that has spread through art, through the media, through the veins and arteries. Well, forgive me, but you're going to fight all of Europe. Uh, uh, you want to know state secrets? No, no. Well, sure, okay. Well, uh, just <laughs> tell me dates and times and places. Uh, can I take notes? You do want to be a general after all. But no, and not the homosexual consultant. This is why I have talked with the Fuhrer, to give you a most honorary title. Oh, not another one. Professor no. of Medicine I... of Germany. Senior Professor of Medicine uh, of Germany. <laughs> and he'll give me this after he declares war. Well, I could ask him to speed things up, but as you can imagine, things are... <laughs> no, Herr Reichsfuhrer, no. I, I, I don't you think... I mean, now forgive me. I am only concerned about your health, as your doctor. You are? Yes, yes, of course. I, uh, Say that again. I am your doctor. Say that again. <laughs> Such a plan, you see, would adversely affect your person. The nervous system would grow overworked. In, term, in turn, the subcutaneous and muscular tissues would seize up. The vessels would, they would, if you attack... Who attacked you? What? <laughs> um, I, uh, I walked into a coat rack. Did uh, Ermgard walk into it, too? Ah, the sun, moon, and stars didn't walk into a coat rack. I really think we should talk about the war. Oh, it'll be over by Christmas. The Fuhrer has crafted the finest army in all the world, all the history of the world! Forgive me, you really think that all of Europe will be over by... Who is she? Is she German? I, I don't... Come on! She's... Uh... Yes. Uh, of course she is. Wait, wait. Uh, I, I didn't know when I... Uh, is, if, if seducing a German citizen by a foreigner is illegal? No. Oh, well, for her, not for you. <laughs> but um, what could happen to her? Is she a real German? Blonde? Aryan looking everywhere? Ah, uh, forgive me, Reichsfuhrer. I don't feel She's comfortable. She's not a Jewess, is she? They can be comely. But envy is, too, as they're secretly working for their monstrous organization. Well, one thing I don't do is choose my women based on their gods. We men! Oh, ho, 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 ho! No, I, 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 I misspoke. No, no, I don't think you did. Tell me, tell me. Uh, how many are there? Uh, uh, what, what do you do with them? Uh, uh, do you have relations with them all together? No, no. Uh, I, no, no? To which one? I, I, uh, Tell me, tell me. I won't have the guards work on you until you give us the information we want. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That is an effect of your treatment. <laughs> I'll talk to you about the war if you talk to me about your women. You, you will. I don't know. Try me. Thank you.